<clears throat> Welcome, and thanks for your patience. I know we're uh, starting a few minutes behind, but it was the technology. Am I too loud? No? Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, welcome to New Orleans, uh, Bending the Arc Towards Justice, New Orleans Black Education and the National and International Struggle Against Market-Based Reform. Um, we have a very eminent panel of uh, uh, sort of commentators that are going to follow my presentation, but they're going to sit out in the audience for now so they can see the screen, and then they'll come up. And then uh, Dr. Kofi Lamode is going to provide commentary a bit later, and we'll have quite a bit of time at the end for going back and forth, comments, questions, and so forth. So we're looking forward to that. Well, I'll get to that a little bit later, the panelists. So, uh, for the past, t I was born and raised in New Orleans. Uh, my name is Kristen Buras. I'm a professor at Georgia State University. And for the past um, decade, I've been working with activists um, on the ground to sort of document um, the experiment that New Orleans has become in market-based education reform. Um, it is the nation's first all charter school district as of this year, the recovery school district. And there have been a number of um, sort of uh, dominant narratives that have unfolded on the ground around the transformative effect of the charter school movement in the city of New Orleans. And the flipping of ed, ed reform in New Orleans is not a mistake, it's upside down on purpose, because what I want to do today and what I hope we hope to do is to sort of turn those dominant understandings on their head or upside down. Um, there are millions of dollars behind circulating a particular kind of narrative around what's happening in New Orleans, which has become a model for urban education reform across the country. We want to challenge that. So, <laughs> This is a picture, uh, any photographs you see are ones that, um, that I've taken in New Orleans. This is a picture um, on New Orleans neutral ground. It was taken about two years after Hurricane Katrina, um, and you can see sort of the advertisements, right, uh, for various charter school networks in the city of New Orleans, KIPP, among some others. Um, you know, in the years after Katrina, some of the charter networks spent upwards of $30,000, even more, on advertising to sort of get their customers, if you will. So as I indicated, and this is just sort of a partial list of, um, of reports, but nationally, since 2005 uh, onward, various think tanks and uh, philanthropies and foundations have put out reports asserting that New Orleans is a, a charter school model to be replicated nationally in Detroit, Chicago, uh, and even currently in Little Rock, um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Everywhere from sort of the, the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, um, which is a conservative think tank, uh, to the Center on Reinventing Public Education, which Paul Hill is involved with, um, to the Heritage Foundation, um, have again asserted um, that this is something um, miraculous, if you will. And the evidence in the ground uh, could not could not be more different. It, this is a. I, I just also wanted to be upfront and very transparent about the lens that I bring to uh, the work that I do in New Orleans. Um, so this is another photo I took in New Orleans, and it's interesting to me because, and disturbing, because it really illuminates, I think, how um, racism and white supremacy are sort of the water that we swim in, if you will. Um, so in the foreground you see um, a billboard, you know, um, sort of criminalizing young black men, right, or, you know, arrested, wanted, um, and so forth. Uh, so you have sort of this deficient, criminalized depiction of the city's African American community. In the background, just behind it, do you see the billboard that says, people you trust? Do you see that? Um, and it has sort of two white faces on there. They are um, uh, journalists. TV commentators for a news station in the city of New Orleans. 
you know, you have the, sort of these things back to back, right? Um, and so um, sort of the white narrative, right, the white voice is something you can trust. Um, and, and we've seen that sort of history um, play out, not just previous to Katrina, but we've seen that history um, uh, of sort of white supremacy exacerbated um, over the past decade. I bring a critical race, in part, a critical race theoretical lens to the work that I do. Um, and, and one of the things that we've seen in New Orleans, and, and I'll be more specific about this in a moment, is the way in which whiteness or white identity has been leveraged as a means to access particular kinds of educational resources. And in many ways, what we see in New Orleans is a charter school movement. Um, am I too loud? Okay, okay, in which, um, in which white, largely white entrepreneurs with a sort of a, a smaller subset of black allies have overtaken largely black public schools. Cheryl Harris talks about sort of leveraging white identity as a form of property. And among the property rights that she lists uh, in the law are the right to use and enjoyment, right, to use and access and accumulate an array of goods and the absolute right to exclude, right, or to dispossess others of access to those benefits and privileges. And you'll see this dynamic um, in, in what I'm talking about in a moment. I also draw upon the work of David Harvey um, and my own mentor, Michael Apple, um, talking about sort of critical theories of political economy. Um, and David Harvey talks about accumulation by dispossession. And again, this is a process, a racialized process that has unfolded in the city of New Orleans. And quite simply, he defines this as when assets belonging to one group are put in circulation as capital for the benefit of another group. So again, you'll see these dynamics. Forceful expulsion of populations. Um, turning various property rights into exclusive property rights, suppression of the commons, right, of the collective um, sort of ethos, suppression of indigenous forms of labor. Keep that in mind when I talk about veteran teachers. Appropriation of assets, neighborhood public schools, et cetera. So, so you remember the images uh, after Katrina, right? and the murderous things that transpired in the city of New Orleans when the city's African-American community uh, was abandoned to die. Um, it, you know, as, as, as this was sort of unfolding, um, as, as bodies were still floating in the water, if you will, um, in the midst of this tragedy, tragedy a, a narrative began to emerge to account for why New Orleans public schools needed to be transformed. And it was a very simplistic narrative. And the narrative was sort of the following, uh, sort of encapsulated in the words of Mary Landrieu, who is a senator in Louisiana. She said this in 2011, but it was said uh, not long after Katrina in many different sort of iterations by policymakers. If the traditional teachers and principals in a school can rally themselves and admit that they failed, they can be a part of the turnaround. If not, they can leave. So again, a very simplistic narrative that somehow it was the city's largely black veteran teachers um, who, you know, it's this invocation of a very long narrative about sort of, um, sort of black intellectual backwardness, laziness, right, sort of foot shuffling, right? So these teachers just weren't doing their jobs uh, and, and if they're removed um, from the schools, all will be well. Of course, uh, those of us in New Orleans who know our history are not so easily led by such a simplistic uh, narrative. Um, the reality is quite different, and one of the things that charter school proponents in New Orleans and elsewhere don't want to talk about is the history of racism. Um, and I think we can't understand the struggles of New Orleans public schools without incorporating that history um, into the conversation. So, you know, very briefly, in New Orleans, uh, in the state of Louisiana and the South more generally, um, for centuries, right, public education was considered the property of Southern whites. Uh, in the early 1900s, the Orleans Parish School Board limited black education to grades one through five. Um, the first publicly funded high school in the city of New Orleans did not open until 1917. The second publicly funded high school did not open until the early 1940s. 
Uh, in the late 30s, up until the late 30s, I should say, there were gross inequities uh, in pay between black and white teachers, and I could go on. Um, but, but the point is that um, there's a certain sort of tragedy and irony to scapegoating African-American veteran teachers in, the, in New Orleans for the conditions in New Orleans public schools, when in fact, that's the very same teachers, right? Right, Kevin, you, you know this, uh, who for over a century longer, right, um, had struggled against conditions of inequity, right, and had sought to teach well um, despite those conditions, and yet now they were to be blamed for the struggles. Uh, this is a picture that I got out of an archive um, from, uh, it comes from uh, the desegregation struggle in New Orleans, but specifically around a high school called Francis T. Nichols, which was actually named after a Confederate general um, and former governor of Louisiana, uh, Francis T. Nichols, and this is um, white students protesting desegregation. This is the history I think that needs to be foregrounded if we want to begin a real conversation about how to make New Orleans public schools equitable. And up to this day, I have yet to get a satisfying answer from charter school proponents about how it is that the educational market remediates a history of white supremacy rather than advancing it, which I contend it absolutely does. So how did the education market come to, uh, to New Orleans? Um, well like this, and I really want you to hear what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is that people had not even been able to get back into neighborhoods to see, as one community member told me, if I have a blade of grass standing in my front yard. Just let me get back and see if I have a blade of grass standing in my front yard before you decide what's going to happen to my neighborhood public schools. I mean, literally, um, in, the, in the, the days sort of following um, Hurricane Katrina, the process of, um, of sort of policymakers um, orchestrating at the local, state, and federal level the takeover of New Orleans public schools was happening and transpiring uh, before, before the, the very community members who were to be most intimately affected by those decisions could even be a part of the process. I mean, they weren't even back in New Orleans yet. Um, just days after Katrina, the Conservative Heritage Foundation put out a report um, calling for a golf opportunity zone, right? Uh, and um, you know, basically, in essence, said that market-based reform, charter schools should be funded by the federal government, and that entrepreneurs should lead the way, should lead the destiny of the Gulf region. Um, and, and what was amazing, too, is I don't remember, if you remember the speech that George Bush gave a few days after Katrina in front of the St. Louis Cathedral, but he, he the words that he invoked in his call for the Gulf, Gulf Opportunity Zone was resonated with the very conservative uh, uh, advocacy of the Heritage Foundation and many others of that, of that time period. So there was a lot of federal um, sort of uh, envisionment, if you will, of uh, New Orleans being uh, an experimental site to advance charter school reform. Uh, but it, it went beyond that. Just two months after Katrina, in November of 2005, Governor Kathleen Blanco called a special legislative session, okay? <clears throat> and at this session, uh, it was determined that a piece of legisl legislation called Act 35 would be passed. So uh, if I say anything th this morning, please follow this and spread the word because this is so key to understand. So when Katrina hit, as all states do, Louisiana had a uh, a, a scoring system for schools, right? And they called it a school performance score. It was a scale of 200, and when Katrina hit in August of 2005, a failing school was defined at the cut point of 60 on a scale of 200. You see that up there at the top in bold. What Act 35 did in November of 2005 was to shift upward the cut point. Understand that at 60, out of 200, that cut point, the existing cut point, 
only a handful of New Orleans public schools were actually defined as failing. Well, you, you can't, the state can't take over schools that aren't failing, right? So by raising the bar to 87.4, which was just below the state average, now 107 of some 127 New Orleans public schools were failing. So it provided the opening, right, to, to take over, the, le the legitimate opening, so to speak, to take over the schools and to charter them out. Uh, you know, legislators, I'm told, were wearing buttons in Baton Rouge uh, during this legislative session, said, rebuild it right. And I think right, <laughs> right, uh, can be invoked in multiple ways, including uh, politically and racially. So that cut point, um, basically enable the state-run recovery school district to take over the vast majority of schools uh, in the city of New Orleans, again, without any community input or consent. And in fact, Governor Kathleen Blanco passed two executive orders during the same period. And what those executive orders did was to suspend laws that basically said that in Louisiana, in order to charter a school, you had to first obtain the input of affected faculty, parents, students, etc. That was suspended, right? Forget that community input stuff. We're taking over the schools. Um, the other thing that I'll point out before I go on about some of the other sort of ways this was orchestrated and the way in which it was very exclusionary is that you'll see that even though the cut point was raised to take over the schools, this is a key point, after the schools began to be chartered out, they shifted the cut point back down to 60 on a scale of 200. Currently, the scale is now 0 to 150. The cut point is 50 out of 150. And they've got some weird formula for giving schools bonus points. So what I'm telling you is that when you hear about the alleged achievement in charter schools in New Orleans, you have to understand that the standard that was used to judge traditional public schools in New Orleans was a more rigorous standard than the standard that is currently being used to judge the city's charter schools. It is truly apples to oranges, and there are other things that make comparisons problematic, but this is a key one that people don't understand. The other thing is that, remember I told you the RSD, Recovery Schools, it took over the vast majority of schools? So only a handful of the schools were actually left under the control of the locally elected Orleans Parish School Board. Again, this is key to understand, and I'm going to share testimony with you in a moment about, uh, that I've heard at public hearings. So um, basically what I'm telling you is that if you are a parent in the city of New Orleans and you have an issue with your charter school, um, you can attempt to go to the unelected board of that charter school and register your grievance. Or you can get in your car and drive to Baton Rouge, 80 some odd miles, right, to talk to the state board, which is over the RSD, because your locally elected school board no longer controls the vast majority of schools in your city. It truly is a vast project of, uh, of disenfranchisement. I mean, you wouldn't think of school reform as rolling back black voting rights, but guess what? The other component of this that is absolutely repulsive um, was the following. So, um, <laughs> Also in November, what a momentous and horrific month, right? If we could just sort of take that off the calendar, things would be so much better, um, I would hope. Um, so in November 2005, the announcement also went out that all, I under, underline the word all, New Orleans veteran teachers and school employees would be fired en masse in the beginning of the new year. Uh, there was no due process. Nothing of the sort. Uh, it was just across the board. So imagine yourself being a teacher. You've lost your home. You don't know where your neighbors are. You probably lost some family members as well. And as if that isn't uh, destructive enough, you're now being told that after 20 or 30 years of working and struggling in New Orleans public schools, you no longer have a job either. Hmm. Really interesting, because see, these teachers that were fired uh, also constituted a large segment. Dr. Renard Sanders knows this. Karen Harper-Royal knows this. These are activists and colleagues that I work with in New Orleans that 
Veteran teachers in New Orleans constituted a substantial portion of the city's black middle class. They were also unionized. United Teachers of New Orleans had a long history in the city of New Orleans sh uh, of struggling for equitable pay, uh, equitable resources in the city's public schools. When the state-run RSD took over the vast majority of schools, because of that level of uh, recalibration of the district, the collective bargaining agreement collapsed because the district with which it had been negotiated essentially no longer existed. So all of these pieces fit together, right? It was attack on black veteran teachers. It was also attack on the union. You know, um, Paul Vallis, who, who later came in as head of the RSD, you know, has made many public proclamations around the fact of, you know, we can't afford to pay these teachers health insurance and pensions. I mean, that's crazy talk, right? Who on earth thinks that the teachers who, who work with our children deserve health care and pensions? Well, we didn't have to worry about that with TFA, and I'll get to that in a moment. What you need to know is that um, a, a highly respected attorney, African-American attorney in the city of New Orleans, um, Mr. Willie Zanders challenged this in court with a team of attorneys. The two lower district courts actually ruled on behalf of the teachers, saying that there was uh, sort of, they were actively, uh, that their property rights were actively undermined um, uh, through this sort of orchestrated uh, reform. The Louisiana Supreme Court, not surprisingly to be quite frank, um, overturned the decisions of the two lower courts. So this wrongful termination lawsuit has now been appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. While the teachers are being fired, uh, and this is the really um, sad thing, uh, an astounding thing, is that you know then policymakers sort of threw their hands up in the air and said, we have a teaching shortage. Yeah, you love that? Literally, nearly simultaneously with the firing of the city's veteran teachers, the, uh, the Department of Ed in Louisiana signed a contract with Teach for America to begin pulling in uh, sort of transient, uh, largely white teachers from outside of the city. Contract with TFA is approved. The other sort of heinous thing that happened is that um, the Superintendent of Ed in Louisiana at the time, Cecil Bacard, diver he sort of applied for federal monies under the guise of paying out-of-work teachers their 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 uh, salaries and benefits, but ab approximately 500 million dollars was diverted instead to the RSD, in part used to give signing bonuses and get this housing allowances to the teachers recruited from out of state. Again. My house, I've been working the district for 20 or 30 years. My house is destroyed. Now am I fired? You're going to give this person who's not a part of this community, recruit them, not give them my job, but basically give them a housing stipend? Uh, none of this was accidental. And it has, it has led to a fundamental sort of racial shift in the city um, in terms of, of the teaching force. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically um, in... 2005, only 10% of the city's teachers were in their first or second year. Just three years later, 33% met that description. A few years later, again, veteran teachers had plummeted to 46% um, of the RSD teachers. Um, prior to Katrina, about 73% of the city's teachers were African American. Uh, just five years later, less than 50% were. Simultaneously, the number of white teachers in the city had nearly doubled. Um, and nearly 40% um, had uh, less than three years of teaching. I mean, there were charter schools uh, in the city of New Orleans in which upwards of 70 or 80, maybe sometimes even higher, percent of the teachers were in their first year of teaching. I mean, almost everyone who busted through the front school doors had never set foot in a school before. And we are told that this somehow is going to be advantageous to African-American children. One veteran teacher put it this way, it's all about the dollars. Our righteous teachers have been trampled upon. They are saying they are revamping the schools or whatever. They get rid of everyone and they rehire whoever they want to rehire. In many cases, they replace veteran teachers with first, second, and third year teachers. There is a vast network um, of philanthropies, um, 
charter school incubators, local, state, and nationally, uh, that have, have pushed forward this agenda. At the center of this is New Schools for New Orleans, which is the leading ch charter school incubator in the city of New Orleans. They've gotten federal I-3 monies, but they've also gotten monies from Broad, Gates, and Fisher Foundations, and have links to the New Teacher Project, Teach for America, et cetera. Um, and so this is sort of part of the network uh, behind um, what has transpired. And in many ways, you could sort of situate Chicago, Detroit, many other cities within this network because some of these uh, actors sort of uh, span the, the geography um, of, the, of the, not just the United States, but beyond, uh, have reached out to the UK and so forth. Um, <laughs> Fundamentally, this is a, a racial re-envisioning and a racial remaking of the city. One of the city's leading charter school proponents, a former member of the school board at the local and state level, started an organization called 504 Word. You like that? 504 is uh, the, the area code um, in New Orleans. And it, it's sort of a social networking um, initiative to sort of make sure that the young professionals who come to the city remain there, right? Uh, because we don't really have people that are that snazzy in New Orleans, right? Uh, and so we need to get some snaz. Uh, so let's bring in some, some, some new folks uh, and many white, young white faces. The other thing, too, um, and I know Pauline can, uh, can speak uh, firsthand about this in terms of her work with the community, um, is, is the destruction of neighborhood public schools, right? This is a map of um, where schools were rebuilt in the city of New Orleans five years out after Katrina. If you've been in New Orleans, you see the French Quarter there in the middle? Okay, you know that's sort of the dividing line between uptown and downtown, between largely white, upwardly mobile, and black working class areas. I mean, you see that uh, in Bywater, Lower Ninth Ward, and New Orleans East, there are very few dots. Because school facility master planners sort of determined that um, where the schools were rebuilt, rebuilt. they got uh, billions of dollars from FEMA, but did not reallocate that necessarily to the neighborhoods, put it in a general fund, and then they decided where schools would be rebuilt. And even though most of the schools are still largely attended by black working class kids, many of them have been relocated in areas outside of those children's neighborhoods. I'm going to skip that for a moment. Um, I want to play a quick video for you um, that um, sort of exemplifies uh, the process and the struggle of what has transpired in New Orleans. This is a video um, from the Lower Ninth Ward from a school called Martin Luther King Elementary School. It predated Katrina, had a long history in the community um, of educating kids and educating them well. Um, and the school was <laughs> basically, uh, not on the school facility master plan to, rebu to be rebuilt, and there was a lot of struggle around um, it coming back. And the community was determined to make the school the, the, the center of rebuilding the neighborhood, and this sort of illuminates part of the struggle. Martin Luther King Jr. from his book, Why We Can't Wait. The disenchanted, the disadvantage, and the disinheritance seen at times of deep crisis to summons up some sort of genius that enables them to proceed and capture the appropriate weapons to carve out their destiny. The times belong to the artist, yes. the children, and the visionaries. Whose time is it? Our time. It's our time. The dream of Dr. Martin Luther King is being transformed in spite of that devastation. It was said that our school would never come back, but we are living witnesses and living proof that where there's a will, there's a way, and where there's hope, Fate will always be there. thought that I would never have to do is say to people in New Orleans, 
that children of color deserve an education and a first class education. And it has been a struggle for all of us. It's been a struggle getting to this point. But we've come this far by faith. And we're going to continue. And we truly believe that we will be back here between March and the beginning of the school year to serve the Lower Ninth Wall community as we continue to rebuild the new New Orleans. Thank you, sir. That was beautifully said. You all got that. We need a lot of help and help. Okay, come this summer and start building, rebuilding your house because the school is coming back. And once they see the school back, that's the life of the, the, the community. Everything goes on in that school. Chief Seattle tells us, teach your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the children of the earth. This we know, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. This we know, all things are connected like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the children of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Take a deep breath in our nose. Was excellent. Talked about you might have dreams. We must not forget that the Dr. King Charter School sits on sacred ground. and dedicated to their memory. 
in Kansas, but this Omaha, and we love it. So now, as we get ready to cut the rip, we thank each and every one of you for the contributions you have made. Take pride in what has been done. Let the world know that the city of New Orleans is coming yeah. Yeah. and the Lord Nightwall is already back. And that is only the tip of the iceberg of what just one community went through to defend its neighborhood public school. But the outcomes have not been have not been pretty. Um, roots run deep here. That sort of says it all, right? That's a picture from the Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, this was a picture of the high school. It's taken almost 10 years for the Lower Ninth School Development Group to uh, struggle with decision makers to get funding for a high school to be built in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, I'm going to skip over some things here. A few more comments and then I want to welcome our panelists up. The exclusionary dynamics just sort of continue at every level. Um, you need to also understand there was a federal civil rights lawsuit that was lodged by about 4,500 um, fa pa parents of kids with children with disabilities asserting that the uh, many of the charter schools in the city of New Orleans were not honoring their uh, federal civil rights under IDEA. Uh, that class in action lawsuit was actually recently settled through a consent decree um, and it has been mandated that an independent monitor is going to come in to oversee the charter schools to ensure that they uh, honor the, the federal uh, civil rights of these disabled kids. And so this is part of this cream skimming process and exclusionary uh, dynamics of these charter schools. Um, this is a picture from a public hearing in 2010 where there was a big sort of debate about whether or not the schools that had been taken over would be returned to the locally elected school board. There you see sort of a strike through no more RSD and there's widespread sentiment around that. Uh, in the city's African-American community. Um, one um, activist sort of stood that evening and said the following, what we're talking about tonight is a simple question of democracy. What we want in Orleans Parish is what every other parish has in this state, and that's the right to control our own schools. High crimes and misdemeanors have been carried out against the people of New Orleans by the Recovery School District and the people who run these charter operations. We do not believe that these schools have served the best interests of the majority of our African-American students. They sure haven't. Even after all the sort of numerical and statistical gymnastics, the cream skimming, the exclusion of special ed kids, et cetera, et cetera, these are the miraculous uh, results of the charter schools in the recovery school district. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, only four RSD schools now 10 years later are above the state average. Uh, the RSD has never achieved an A-ranked school in t after 10 years of charter school reform uh, and teacher renovation. Um, the ACT scores were withheld by the state ed superintendent for an entire year because they were so embarrassing, I presume. And it was actually Mercedes Schneider, uh, a blogger and veteran teacher outside of New Orleans who discovered these scores. Uh, and uh, the composite was 15.7. The vast majority of kids coming out of New Orleans charter schools can't even get into a four-year institution in Louisiana because you need a 22 as a baseline. Uh, Newsflash, illustration, uh, Future is Now, a charter school operator sort of network in New Orleans. You have you know, a CEO making 250000 a year. Um, and what does the school rank? 9.3 on a scale of 150. It's a great use of public tax dollars, and it looks like they're doing wonders for African-American kids in the city. Uh, there have also been civil rights complaints lodged against uh, uh, charter school networks such as collegiate academies. Um, 
this no excuses charter school model, right? Marching kids around, uh, silence must be respected. Even, even sort of the, the uh, physical control over the black body, right, uh, is key here. Um, again, parents saying, look, th this is violating our kids' basic civil rights uh, and, and, and sort of ability to sort of uh, to, to learn. The state of Louisiana actually sort of blew off that claim, but that doesn't really mean very much to us in New Orleans because they also blew off the administrative complaint by Southern Poverty Law Center around the disabled kids. So, um, you know, the, the, and I'm going to conclude here. The, the sad thing is that rather than reform being sort of um, in, in, enforced from outside, right, there are indigenous traditions in the city of New Orleans that should be the model for edu you know, reforming schools. So here you see Jim Randall's Kalama U.S. Salam, Ashley Jones, Ashley, I don't know if you're here, um, who developed a program over two decades ago called Students at the Center. It's a literacy program that, um, that uh, connects writing to community activism. Many of the kids go on to get education degrees and come back intergenerally, intergenerationally to sort of uh, teach with students at the center. Um, you've got the Guardian Institute uh, by Sharice Harrison Nelson, um, whose uh, father was a very sort of respected Mardi Gras Indian in the city. There's a long tr tradition of Mardi Gras Indian resistance, um, who has run programs in the schools around uh, culture and the arts and oral history. These are the traditions um, that we should be building on um, in the city of New Orleans, but have not. And unfortunately, this is not completely unique. Um, and so I would like to invite our panelists up um, because one of the things that, come on up guys, uh, is that they, I've um, sort of asked them to do is to comment on whether or not they feel that this sort of model is in fact a model for black education. Um, and so I'm going to have them introduce themselves um, and take their seats, and then we're going to sort of focus our discussion on sort of three key questions that I'll put up um, in just a moment. And actually, as they're seating themselves, um, I'll read you the questions, and I'll put them up on the screen um, in a moment. So the questions that um, that uh, the panelists will be responding to are one, should New Orleans define the, the future of black education? Why or why not? How have the New Orleans model and the culture of the market influenced public schools and education policy in cities nationally and globally? Okay. And the third one is, what are the principles and practices that have animated struggles for educational justice in black working class communities historically and in the current era of market-based reform, how have culture, language, and heritage, the themes that Dr. King has put out for us this conference, served as resources in this struggle? So those are the questions that we're going to talk about. And we could introduce ourselves, please. Michael Apple. I'm Michael we'll Apple. Order. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Um, is this working? Yes, it is. So I am Michael Apple. And the Thank you, Kristen, very much for a, a very distressing, yet hopeful at the end, uh, position. So I want to place this uh, in its larger context, even larger than what uh, Kristen has mentioned. Uh, many of us who call ourselves progressives are guided by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Carter Woodson, Anna Julia Cooper, and George Counts challenging educators to raise a particular kind of question, which is, can schools change society? And for many people on the left, it's, of course not. We have to change the economy first, and thereby let schools off the hook and the racial structuring of schools off the hook. I think that what we're seeing is the right fundamentally answering that question. As part of a larger ideological and economic process, the right has shown dramatically that the schools are central to social transformation. They're central for ideological transformation. They're central for the control of who people think they are. And even more importantly, they show powerfully that we can, as in Illinois now, and in Wisconsin now, that we don't need teachers after all. Now that's profound in terms of its ideas of what it means to work for the common good, for what counts as being public. So in my own state, 
the state of Wisconsin, which feels like Germany in 1938 right now, or like New Orleans, okay? uh, those people who get any form of public assistance will be drug tested. Of course, the corporations that make the decisions who have eight martinis at lunch will not be tested as they destroy communities. And those people who are going to be teachers now only need to be tested by a test that will be purchased from Pearson, well beyond the EdTPA, in which anyone who has been a child, seen a child in a movie, need not have any experience whatsoever, but will be hired as a teacher, thereby destroying, as has happened and will happen in this state, the collective sensibilities of teachers working with communities. So I want us to think for a minute about what is going on here, that education now has become a central site, not only, you'll forgive that word, for the transformation of schools and identities, but for fundamental social transformation that prefigures the ideological and economic tax on just about everything. So what we're seeing in many ways now, powerfully, is that the right has understood Gramsci better than anyone else. Gramsci makes a distinction between two kinds of war. You'll forgive the masculinist metaphor, but it feels like a war and not just in, just in New Orleans. It's a war here and in Chicago where some of it was won. Gramsci makes a distinction between a war of maneuver and a war of position. A war of maneuver looks something like World War I. Michael's here and I've got this horrible thing called the machine gun. You're out there, you've got a machine gun. Someone yells charge, I yell charge, and whoever the hell is left standing wins. The right says, that's not how we proceed. What we proceed is what's called a war of position. We fight everywhere. Sewers, planning commissions, as Pauline so eloquently demonstrates in her own work, the right to the city, everything including teachers, teacher unions, communities, and we change the common sense of whether that is good or bad. And what we're seeing in the warnings, it seems to me, is a fundamental struggle as one of the um, slides that uh, was powerful um, as part of Kristen's data, we're seeing it's a struggle for democracy. So we can think about two kinds of democratic forms, thick and thin. So if we were to have a conversation about that school, it would be what we call thick democracy. Democracy which fully participates with communities or in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where students participate in the debates over where a budget is spent, even for simple things like where a football field will be built in their community. So gang leaders are taken out of the prison pipeline and told, here's 100,000 real, you decide where the football field goes. So it's thick. What we are seeing is a fundamental transformation of our very ideas that have an emotional economy, an idea that democracy must be fully participatory. Instead, democracy is now choice on a market. And the schools are actually the fundamental experiment in the radical transformation of society. Now, that can only be done if we remember or forget Charles Mills' brilliant analysis in a racial contract that most of our ideas about rationality, about who's a good person, who's rational, who's not, is based on a racial contract. So you will be given almost everything, good schools, health care, assistance, provided you look like Michael Apple. But when the polluted body and culture of the, in quotes, other, now demands the right to a school, to a city, now we demonize, it is irrationality, and we transform that irrationality into it's a problem for democracy. So in my understanding of what is going on in, in New Orleans, I have to understand, again, this is part of a much larger dynamic, and that makes it harder, but it actually makes it easier for those of us in education. If we understand that the schools play a central role in this fundamental transformation, it means that we should respect our enemies in ways that maybe they don't realize. Since they have chosen to do their experiment on schools, there must have been victories. 
And that means that it's not just finding new things, it's restoring and keeping alive many of the traditions we already do. And as Kristen reminded us, to restore the collective memory of real people dedicating themselves to the social transformations that have been going on for years. So thank you. We're sort of going in alphabetical order. Dr. Franklin, um, welcome. In light of your, your vast work um, and editorship of the Journal of African American History and sort of Michael's invocation of sort of collective memory, could you, I mean, obviously you can f comment as you wish, but could you also say something a bit about the importance of that history of struggle and collective memory um, and how that sort of rebounds off of this uh, sort of current struggle? Uh, I'm currently at the uh, University of California at Riverside uh, but I'm a Katrina refugee. I'm a Katrina refugee. I was teaching at Dillard University in New Orleans, and unfortunately, as a result of the 10 feet of water that Dillard had on its campus, it was no longer, it was, it was not able to uh, sustain its uh, operations in the manner uh, in which it had begun. Uh, when I arrived, and I, and I had been, t I, I came when Katrina hit. In other words, I arrived in August of 2005 to accept the Dow chair at Dillard University, and I arrived on like August 15th, and Katrina came on August 28th. And I, you know, I, so, someone call, called me and said, oh, the storm is coming, the storm is coming. And I said, well, I said you gotta go, you gotta go. And I said, well, Go where? Well, you know, I just got there. It, it I had been there by two or three weeks. And he said, you got to go. You got to go. And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to Arkansas uh, and stay with my father. And so, you know, so I'm going to leave and stuff. I said, oh, this is a friend of mine from my church. And, and so I said, well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe we can go. Maybe we can go with you, you know, because I don't know what to do. I just arrived. <laughs> And she said, well, you may want to go. He said, but the problem is, is that uh, my father is a 90-year-old homophobic racist. And he may not be, you may not be comfortable. I said, I'll take Katrina. <laughs> but, but I also want to point out something else in terms of the, the impact that, in other words, Dillard University has not come back. When I arrived there, there were 2,200 students at Dillard University in August, at the beginning of August 2005. And in the fall, because I've maintained my connections with Dillard and I'm returning to New Orleans this year, uh, there were 1,200 students at Dillard University. But, and the other historically black colleges in New Orleans have also not recovered. And this is a very sad situation because uh, I also taught at Xavier University. And some of you may know that Xavier University uh, produces uh, the, one of the largest number of African American students that graduate from Xavier and then go on to medical school. So that when I was teaching at uh, when I was teaching at Xavier at the early in like 2002, there were I, there were, in the graduating class of about 400 students, you had 90 that had been accepted to medical schools. Okay, 90. Now I'm at the University of California now. The whole 10 campuses of the University of California do not produce 90 African-American students entering, entering medical school after four years. And so, and, and, and so I've been in touch with Xavier. I was at Xavier uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, they said, oh, well, we now, we have gotten up to uh, 4,200 4, students, but we had 4,700 students. So here you have a situation where you have an HBCU that had been demonstrating that it could graduate students that go to the finest medical, get, get accepted in medical schools around the country in such large number, and pharmacy schools, et cetera, 
and they have they and because of the problems with the with the grant with the Pell grants and all of these problems they have not they have not been able to fill their classes and there and this is a situation where a school had demonstrated had demonstrated its ability to train uh, African American students at the highest level and to get them into all of the medical schools. There was there was one of their students who was who went to Harvard Medical School after graduating from Xavier had 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 was on the cover of of uh, Black Issues in Higher Education because he was at that time instructing the other uh, the other new medical students at Harvard uh, in various uh, fields of medicine because he had already had it at Xavier, and so, and so and so the situ the devastation that occurred as a result of uh, of Xavier is not just the public, the elementary and secondary schools; it's also the institutions of of higher education. Now, one of, the th one of the activities that I have been engaged in, I'm a historian, okay, and one of the areas that I'm working on is the history of student activism. And I've been documenting the history of student activism, particularly during the uh, civil rights era. And I have a traveling exhibit that's been traveling around the country on children, youth, and civil rights and the, ch and the contributions of young people in, t in the civil rights movement. And, uh, and, it, and the places that uh, are represented include Prince Edward County, Virginia, Little Rock, Arkansas, Birmingham, Alabama, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Chicago, New York City, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, and Riverside, uh, California, where I was teaching. And so I've been documenting the role that teenagers, elementary school and teenagers, have played in the uh, civil rights struggles. And one of, the, one of the issues that is currently a problem in, uh, in New Orleans, in this new uh, uh, recovery district, is the testing. Is the testing. I was just there. I was just in New Orleans, and I was talking to the teachers in the, in the school, and they said they, they have up to four testing periods for of the students in any given school year. And the and and I said, but well, I said, but how's that affecting the students? They said, well, you see the dropout rate, because basically what you what you have going on in many of the schools is teachers teaching with, with a script, engaging in test prep, and the students spending all of this time preparing for tests and being traumatized by having the test and say, why should I go keep going to this school just to take, so I can take tests? And so the, but at the same time, we have a movement among, teen, among teenagers around the country and their parents against this high stakes testing, against this high stakes testing. And so, and so, so in doing the history of student activism, I've documented the, the various situations where, around the country, where students have organized to protest against lack of resources, against uh, unfair, uh, uh, act, uh, unfair uh, treatment in the discipline, uh, and, and, and other uh, reasons why the students organized to protest and organize boycotts uh, of their school because of the conditions under which they were, they were living. And so, uh, as I document the uh, history of these of student activism around the country, from the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, etc., I'm going to, uh, and I'm returning to New Orleans to live, and I will be uh, ad ad uh, advising the students that they need to organize, like other students have organized against the high stakes testing. And I'm just gonna read a, a brief quote here uh, from, the, from uh, Monty Neal, who is the head of the FAIR test that is challenging the high stakes testing around the country. And this is from a book that I hope you'll be able to get. It's called More Than a Score, More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing. And the editor is Jesse Hook. Hagobian, okay, so I'm recommending that you, but I'm reading from uh, Monty Neal in the Fair Test Foundation. <clears throat> the race <clears throat> and class composition of the movement against high stakes testing 
is a vital concern. Urban activist student groups are often multiracial. However, in some locales, boycotts, opt-out movements are seen as mainly white or privileged. In other communities, activists say privileged groups are less likely to collaborate with those from other neighborhoods. Suburban parents and teachers may not know or have ties to urban groups. Some wealthier city parents may capitalize on their children's higher test scores to gain admission into elite public schools, using tests to perpetuate inequality even as they protest them. Urban parents of color are far more likely to have serious concerns about educational quality that have led to many to support testing as a way of judging schools. The absence of an agenda for strengthening schools, whether rural, suburban, or in urban communities, can all support, uh, can all support could fa fatally undermine the movement. These activists must take steps to address race and class inequality in schooling and in the movement. And so I'm returning to New Orleans and I'm working on student activism and we're going to deal with and I'm going to work on doing something about getting these students to join this movement against high stakes testing. Thank you. Thank you, and that's excellent. There have actually been, not very well publicized, but student walkouts around a number of these issues. There was a coalition of high school students from various high schools who walked out um, out of frustration of novice teachers, testing, all these kinds of things. So we look forward to you building on, on that. Thank you. Dr. Pauline Lippman. Um, I'm not sure which question I should respond to, so I'll just start talking. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Kristen, for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, it's sort of, for me, the highlight of, of being here in a way. And so um, I want to respond first to the question of should New Orleans define the future of black education and why or why not? And I want to say something broad that I think um, is probably not said as well as what you said in your powerful introduction, but um, that captures some of the essence of this. Under the colonial logic that we know what is best for you, a cabal of corporate elites, government officials, think tanks, billionaire venture philanthropies, and corporate so-called reform groups are making decisions about the education of working class African American students. That's actually what's happening that they are devising programs to hand them over to private operators, not just in New Orleans, but across the country. This is really, we need to be really clear that this is really not about educating children. It's not an education plan. It has absolutely nothing to do with education. It's about real estate and financial speculation. It's about privatization of public goods. It's about capitalizing on disaster, multiple kinds of disasters, to open up a new education investment sector. It's about white supremacy, displacing African-American working class people under the logic the land is valuable and the people are not, and redeveloping it for new, whiter, more affluent clientele. It's about disciplining a low-wage workforce with a notion of education that's based on human capital development, not human development. So in Chicago, Chicago's African-American parents and community members have been documenting for 10 years that as in New Orleans, closing schools that were anchors in communities and replacing them with charter school franchises displaces communities and disenfranchises parents to shutter public schools named for Mahalia Jackson, Benjamin Banneker, Marcus Garvey, Mary McLeod Bethune, Wendell Phillips, Walter Diet, as was done in Chicago, and to open up these charter school franchises that replace them signals contempt for the communities and erasure of African American heritage. This process is relational. The disposability of public schools in working class black communities 
is linked to the overvaluing of schools and children and gentrified and upper middle class white areas of the city. And this is true in New Orleans, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, and elsewhere. The collusion of the state, and I think your, your diagram so powerfully captured this, the collusion of the state and capital to dispossess African Americans of their schools is part of a larger process of, as you said, accumulation by dispossession that includes dismantling public housing, foreclosing homes, closing clinics and hospitals, privatizing other public services, and selling off black communities to real estate developers and financial speculators. So they think this illustrates the imbrication of capital and race in the restructuring of our cities across the country. So the question was, should New Orleans define education for black children? Well, not that version of New Orleans, but we can answer that two ways. We could also say yes, that the heritage of education in New Orleans, that King's School that you so powerfully showed us, that should define the future. So this is very contested. It's, there is a powerful hegemonic process going on, but it's deeply contested. Um, can I, a couple more things? Okay. So I also want to talk about um, how has the New Orleans model, um, how has it influenced public schools and education policy in cities nationally and globally? And so Detroit, New York, Chicago have all closed more than 100 schools. Actually, we now have 157 school actions in Chicago. Columbus. Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Houston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Kansas City, Milwaukee, and Baltimore closed more than 25. New York, 13 since 2009. In Chicago, we've had 157 school actions. That means closings by various names. 87% of the students affected were African American in a district that's now 40% African American. Some African American co communities in Chicago have almost no public schools left. They kind of look like New Orleans. 25% um, of all CPS schools with majority of African American students and teachers were closed since 2001, 25%. Chicago Public Schools lost 4,385 African-American teachers. The black teaching force fell from 40% to 23%, while white teachers increased from 45% to 62%. I see Jen shaking her head. <laughs> Chicago now has 174 charter schools. They're in black and brown communities. It doesn't seem to be good enough for the white affluent communities. Charter schools have a whiter, less experienced, more unstable teaching force, and their suspension rates in Chicago are 10 times the neighborhood public schools. So what I want to say about this, though, is that education privatization and markets are driving education nationally and globally, but they do take different paths in different contexts. And this is important for us in terms of how we fight it. So in New Orleans, neoliberals capitalized on the devastation of Katrina to push out New Orleans' black working class population and close the schools. The Detroit takeover of schools and the appointment of an emergency manager with disastrous consequences for Detroit's African American students, as Tom Padroni has very powerfully demonstrated, um, is rooted in decades of private disinvestment in the city. In another version yet of disaster capitalism, officials in Chicago and Philly are seizing on the economic crisis to abandon public education in black communities. Under the guise, there is no alternative to austerity, and guess who must tighten their belts? Yet in every case, these strategies map onto the racialized landscape of the city, onto its, their histories of racial segregation, redlining, public and private disinvestment, the theft of land, black land and labor, and the consequences of the education debt owed to African Americans historically. So I think that what we see is that the principles and the practices that have guided the resistance in, um, in Chicago are very similar to what you're talking about in New Orleans. And I just want to end by quoting a few sort of slogans, refrains, calls um, that we hear over and over again. 
So we have been fighting for 10 years against school closings and privatization in Chicago. And at the core is a demand for racial justice and human rights. Why is it the answer for black communities always privatization? The journey for justice, whose leadership is in Chicago, calls school closings and privatization a human rights violation. The right to education is a right to full humanity. The fight to defend and transform neighborhood public schools is also a fight for the community itself. When you close a school, you cut the heart out of a community. It's animated by the demand for enfranchisement and self-determination, just as you pointed out in New Orleans. We hear this all around the country. We are the people who could save our schools. And we want what every other community has, the right to control our schools. So I just want to end by saying that there is a dialectic unfolding. There is a contest taking place. And it's a contest for the heart and soul of public education, and especially in communities of color. In Chicago, there, a new social actor has taken the stage. And that is African American and Latino parents and community organizations, uh, progressive teachers, and the Social Justice Chicago Teachers Union. And we are fighting for an elected representative school board to, to when every other district in the state has the right to elect their school board, the mayoral appointed board is how this whole agenda is pushed through. We, we won 89% of the vote in 37 of the 50 wards in Chicago in the last municipal election. We have a mandate and we're fighting for an elected school board. And we're fighting for 50 sustainable schools. They closed 50 schools in 2013. We want 50 sustainable, community-driven, state-of-the-art, fully resourced community schools. And the first one and the first step, this is not an abstract demand. It's very concrete. We are fighting for Diet High School, which is in the heart of Bronzeville, the Harlem of the Midwest, that, will, that was phased out in 2012. If it's closed, there will be no more neighborhood open enrollment high school in Bronzeville. And we are fighting to revitalize Diet High School as a, as a neighborhood, community-driven, rich school of global leadership and green technology. And we're not talking about global leadership to compete in the global economy. We're talking about global leadership to transform this, this society. And this is a campaign that the people in that community have fought, chained themselves to a statue on the fifth floor of City Hall fighting for this, and, and will not rest until justice comes. So I think that we are, um, and you know, we gave Rahm Emanuel a run for his money. He did not so much win that election, but as Jesse Sharkey, Vice President of the CTU said, he survived it. And the reason that happened was because of the organizing that parents and community members have done. So we need to see that there are many, many devastating defeats but the, it is a protracted struggle and that there's a new social actor in, in, in this country and in Chicago. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Teresa Perry. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's very sad to be here uh, and joyous because um, right after Katrina, a group of five of us were the first educators to be on the ground. They included myself, Lisa Dalpit, Charles Payne, Daniela Coley, and uh, Warren Simmons. And um, we spent a lot, and we went back many, many times during that first year. And I can tell you that we could get, we got very little support or audience among the national um, academic community. Uh, it was very lonely. And we met with um, Brenda, who was then head of the union. We met with teachers who had been um, fired and teachers who had been fired and then 
couldn't support, uh, pay for their cancer treatment because they didn't have um, a health insurance. We met with activists uh, for the special ed kids in the city who didn't have a school to go to because the charter schools that were developing wouldn't um, admit them. Um, and we, but we also met with people at Xavier University and um, around the city. So I guess yeah, I'm happy to be here, but I do think that in moments of crisis like this, how do organizations mm. like this take a full and forceful position that is not designed to protect their status with nonprofits and other funders. Because I believe at that time that had we been able to get, uh, we talked all the time about Bush changing, uh, Bush being in, also incentivizing uh, the development of, of charter schools. We talked all the time about them changing the level at which you had to perform in order for the school to be taken over. We even went down many times to hold conferences to try to get the people who were left in the few southern, few public schools to talk to people who were in charter schools to try to radicalize them. So uh, I guess my point is how do we uh, respond as an academic body to things that are really unjust and not wait until we can get to the point where we can analyze them uh, in terms of scholarly papers. That's my first point. Now we, we went down because all of us had some connection to New Orleans. Um, I had gone as an undergrad to Loyola University. As you know, Lisa Delpit is from Baton Rouge. Charles had taught at Southern University. My first teaching job was at uh, Xavier University. My, uh, uh, and Daniela Coley was a young scholar who staffed the whole project. And she, if she were here, I'd give sh shout outs to her because she was a young scholar and she really did all the support for the first two, the, two years where we were back and forth in New Orleans. Um, you know, I agree with everything uh, Pauline said, but I th see, here's the deal. The discourse about charter schools has not been powerful enough to engage black and brown communities. It's largely had a white face uh, I think the reason Chicago has been so powerful a place is because they had Karen Lewis. And Karen Lewis uh, moved the union, and as a leader of the union, she moved the union to a place where they were respected and believed by ordinary people in Chicago. Uh, so my question is, how do we talk about it in a way? How do we talk about privatization in a way that connects what's happening to historic disenfranchisement and also to the, the powerful historic struggle of black people for education. Mm -hmm. um, how do we talk about it in a way that young people tweet about it on social media? How do we talk about it in a way that uh, the, all these young black activists understand it? and want to uh, organize around these issues. We're not there yet. It doesn't capture them. Uh, the language does not pull young black people in, even young activists. And, uh, and I think the final thing is, how do we talk about it in race ways? It's, you know, in other words, how do we say that this movement is about the oppression of black and brown people in American cities and the disenfranchisement and the taking away their rights to self-determination and education. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Dr. Dave Stovall. <clears throat> 
Peace and greetings, y'all. Hopefully, uh, everybody's all right this uh, Sunday morning. Uh, 8.15 is a hell of a time uh, anywhere, right? All right, let's get down with this. I think, I think there are two things, uh, and I want to uh, say again, thank you again, Kristen, for putting this panel together. I am honored to be in the presence of folks on this panel in every way. And I also want, in these spaces, to push us to think a little differently. Um, in terms of, you know, the research community doesn't like stark language, right? The research community always wants to make something saliable, right, or sanguine to whoever the hell they think they're uh, talking to, right? But I will say unequivocally, I do not care about that. So, in that understanding, the first answer to the question, should New Orleans define the future of black education? If we are talking about the ways in which states have historically engaged in the colonial imperialist materialist project of white supremacy and genocide, fuck no. Let's be clear. Now, if we understand that what was said earlier, should the resistance of everyday folk in New Orleans actually be a part of the consideration of the future of black education, then I would say yes, right? So this thing around, and how is this New Orleans model impacted some of the things like Pauline has mentioned and then some of the other things that are happening here in Chicago, I think it becomes very important for us to understand, and this is kind of what Harvey and Hackworth and uh, folks who study neoliberal urbanism always talk about. And so when we look at things like gentrification and neoliberal urbanism, is place driven. So the principles are the same, but they manifest themselves differently. So if we think about a place like Chicago, you are now in one of the most segregated cities in the world, right? It's always a funny thing. It's like, why the hell is Chicago and Milwaukee the two most segregated cities in the world? And they're like, how does that happen in Milwaukee? But that's another story, right? But if we think about Chicago, when you have this hyper-segregation and you think about a city that is predicated on black and brown disposability, then you do certain things. So when we think about school closure, and Pauline laid it out, those names of black historical figures, right, now being eviscerated, like Dylan Rodriguez often talks about, the evisceration of memory, right? So now, if you can think about this, and if you think about neighborhoods, so don't think about gang beefs, right? That's, that's, that's hype for television. Think about it in terms of communities that have been marginalized, isolated, and disinvested. Now, if you have those communities that have no knowledge of another community that may be adjacent to you, you close one school and send all the young folks to a receiver school in the other area. What happens on the first day? Heavy conflict. Now, do that 50 times and 157 times since 2004. Now, here in Chicago, we even, we've even upped the ante on this. We have been in a 22-year process. We have been enforcing federal RICO statutes on quote-unquote gang leaders. And here's what this does. So now in Chicago, you had, loose, you had allegiances in particular sets. You know, some people refer to them as gangs, but they're really organizations. You need to, we need to think about it differently. Now, you bifurcate those sets because you've locked up the leadership. They thought the, in the genius of the Illinois state government, they thought that RICO statues would work the same way on black folks like they worked on the mafia. Didn't happen. In fact, what actually happened is you now get a space where this is kicked up and people are now, when the leadership disappears, young folks who may be weaponized are now fending for themselves in spaces that they have been displaced to. So now you have conflict on the ground and you have conflict in the schoolhouse. Now you do something else. You don't have a place for them to live. I was in New Orleans 10 days before the storm. I went, I went back six months after. And I was in the lower ninth ward and I saw a part of a person's house. And on the side of it was spray painted Baghdad. And here in Chicago, we have a new nickname. 
right? It's even been capitalized by folks like Spike Lee and Kanye West. Chirac. But the conflict has been engineered. It is not a natural occurrence. It is one that is facilitated by the state as a form of state-sanctioned violence to officially ground itself in the disposability of black and brown populations. Now, the city of Chicago has lost 200,000 residents since 2000. 178,000 of those residents were black. Where did they go? And in those spaces where they have been displaced to, what happens in those schools? How are they marked? Just like in New Orleans, I ran into, I was in Tucson, Arizona, six months after the storm, I run into two young people walk up to me and say, tell me, they were put on a plane. They were not told where the plane was going. They landed three hours and they said, welcome to Tucson. And I think about this in Chicago when we find young folks and their families all spread throughout the state, as far north as Duluth, Minnesota, as far south as St. Louis and Ferguson, Missouri. So when we think about this, right, and going to the third question, what are the principles and practices that we need to pay attention to? So if we think about self-determination through culture, language, and critical analysis, this is something that black people have fought for since the recording of black bodies in the Western Hemisphere since 1548. And the question becomes, what are the ways that we actually engage those types of ancestral knowledge to create the spaces that change our realities? Not theoretically, but concretely. Right? Because this is, what, this is what the current future of neoliberal co corporate deformed education is telling us. The ability of black children to think and create is null and void. What will you do to contest it, interrupt it, and create something differently? Stephen O'Harney, Stephen O'Harney and Frank Moten talk about a fugitive space. In this fugitive space are the realities of our communities and the will to create despite what the state puts on our back. And I think these are the spaces that we need to think about in moving forward and talking about education on the backs of the dispossessed. Thank you all. Thank you. Dr. Tarana White. Good morning, my name is Terenda White. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, because it's a Sunday morning, I think it's fitting to tell a, uh, a Sunday school, give you a Sunday school lesson, actually. <laughs> um, and this is, this is speaking to Teresa's point about how do we radicalize and engage communities of color, uh, or you know, communities that are, are being dis, sort of enfranchised by what we know are problematic reforms related to market markets and neoliberalism. And this sort of comes from um, a reverend in Harlem where I did my work on sort of understanding the charter sector that was emerging and has been, and it's particularly Harlem is a foothold of the charter sector in New York City. Of Manhattan's 40 odd charter schools in 2012, 75% 70, 70, uh, of them were concentrated in that Harlem community, okay? And about 65% of them were controlled by charter management organizations, okay? And almost all of those were no excuses uh, practices or no excuses schools. And so I, I've been writing about why it is those kinds of schools have emerged in, in black communities. But th there's a war for um, language and justice, this idea of who who's delivering civil rights or who is bringing justice um, as equity, um, as choice in, in communities of color. And what happened during my research 
Um, and that time was a very powerful moment where uh, Reverend, Wal uh, Reverend Michael C. Waldron, I don't know if you are familiar with, with, with Harlem, but he's a young social justice and progressive pastor whose high school was on the chopping block for being closed and charter schools had co-located in, in his, his high school. And he actually preached a really interesting sermon that I think helped to radicalize and shake up a little bit of some of the community members in that space. And it was really, what he called it was the myth of competitive healing. Um, and he told the story of Bethesda, where there were, there's a pool in, in, in ancient Bethesda where an angel would come every year, and those who were wounded uh, could go to that pool and get healing, but you had to get there first. And there was a competition for healing. And he talks about the myth of competitive healing that has sort of um, captivated this uh, the communities that, that many of our, our, our people are in, and the idea that if I can compete individually with someone else, I can find healing. And I think that's interesting, particularly in places that have experienced trauma, um, not just the physical storms, but the centuries of racialized disinvestment uh, by the state, right? And so there is a need for for something, and so, but the idea that that healing is going to come through competition has captivated many of our parents and our and our teachers or, or whatnot. So, I think the language is important. Uh, who controls the language about what is justice and what is equity and what is civil rights? And so, this idea that competition will bring us something, when reality is, it, it takes us away from what collectively ails us all, which is you know the the, the continued state disinvestment in our, our public schools, right? And so I think that's important for how I oriented myself to this work, not just my head, but my heart, and, and trying to understand how you engage the hearts and the minds of, of people in our communities. And, and I particularly really appreciate this book, Dr. Burris, because I, and I particularly want to talk about the chapter on TFA and, and union busting and, and black veteran educators because it, and it relates to how do we restore the collective memory um, of what our educators were doing in that city despite disinvestment, right? And, to, and, and the language around the reason why there's the uh, problematic outcomes in those schools was, was because of mismanagement or incompetent teachers. And so my, my struggle as a young researcher is actually engaging young educators who are participating in many of the new spaces that have been created. How do we engage our young professionals? Um, and I think it's, it, it was easier when, when TFA was predominantly white. Um, so, you know, this, the, is, is, the critique was much easier when it's the white novice TFA teacher and up against black veteran educators. But it's, it's, it's very uh, nuanced now, and I, and I think, in fact, I, I think the, the way in which people appropriate even our critiques very swiftly um, should factor into how we continue to, to go forward in our critiques. And so I find it ironic that you know, TFA has become much more diverse, and I think that's important, but I find it ironic that the language around this sort of diversity initiatives are, is called the collective, the collective of, of sort of new, diverse TFAers. And, and, and on the surface, I think that's, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> um, but we have to make sure we parse out how disconnected that collective is from those who were on the front lines fighting for their collective bargaining rights, right? Who were fighting for um, the collective professional uh, rights of all educators. And so there's a, a moment where there is a, a, a generational sort of disconnect sometimes. And I wonder how do I engage and write about um, all young profess, uh, teachers in, who are trying to decide where to work and where to, to spend their professional lives, including educators of color. And I don't want to write about that in a way that perpetuates ideas of, of people being easily duped or that they're disciples or that they are dilettantes. I think some of that is true, but I think there's a much more nuanced story there. But I want to be able to tell that story and also not, not back down from the critique of, of complicity in, in what is ultimately a part of anti-democratic processes that are helping to really push away from 
the, the rights that have been sort of secured and the collective memory of what educators before us have done. Mm -hmm. So um, I thank you for that particular chapter and for those of us who need to wrap our heads around how do you engage not just communities of color, but, but all educators as well, particularly the greener force of educators and, and how it is they think about what they're doing in these schools. So. Dr. Kofi Lamodi will provide um, closing remarks. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Kofi Lomote, and I've been asked to provide some uh, discussant remarks. I was first asked to be a discussant in an AERA session about 30 years ago, and I began by saying my responsibility is to convince you that there was some logic employed in putting all of these presentations together. Uh, obviously, there's no need for me to do that in this session because there was a clear logic. And each of the presentations in this session has unequivocally illustrated a number of things. First, that the current reforms in New Orleans, like those throughout the United States, have not benefited, benefited those who have needed them the most. More specifically, I would argue that there has never been a major education reform in this country that has benefited the majority of African American students. Second, uh, I would say that um, we've also learned or had it reinforced that institutionalized white racism is alive and well in the U.S. That is, in, in 2015, uh, people continue to be discriminated against based upon the color of their skin, the amount of money they have in the bank, their gender, their sexual orientation, their height, their weight, their beauty, et cetera. And I would, I would argue further that institutions in society work in concert to perpetuate those illegitimate forms of exclusion. Third, um, it has been reinforced for us that while charter schools may not be an inappropriate solution by definition, in practice they have been a failure. And then last, as Franz Fanon said, one cannot expect the oppressor to facilitate the liberating process of the oppressed. We learned in one of the early slides that um, in 2005, New Orleans mirrored the period following Brown, the so-called desegregation period, wherein large numbers of black educators lost, lost their jobs due to school closures. We also learned during our discussion, uh, or it was reinforced, um, that this notion of market-based education reform, um, wherein uh, there are more charter schools in New Orleans, percentage-wise, than in any city in the United States. And, and that, that's not an accident, that's all by design. And I would argue that New Orleans, in a sense, is not an anomaly. You've heard about what's happening in Chicago from Pauline and David. I've argued for 30 years, as have others, that the education of African Americans, or the, I should say the disenfranchisement of African Americans has been persistent and pervasive. Persistent is in that you cannot identify a period of time since it became legal to educate blacks wherein 
we have done well in large numbers. Pervasive because I would challenge you, even in 2015, to identify a single school district that has done well with the majority of African American students in their charge. Again, institutions in society work in concert. It's not an accident that educational reforms such as those in Chicago and in New Orleans provide a direct path to the prison industrial complex. It's by design, it's not by accident. I started uh, keeping tabs uh, when this session began because I was interested in seeing how many people would mention the prison industrial complex. You know, recall I said that institutions and society work together. Um, and only Michael mentioned the prison industrial complex. Um, I want to take my closing two minutes or whatever I have to say a little bit about U.S. prisons, and, and most of what I'm going to say you all know. And then I want to talk about Louisiana prisons, um, uh, which, which you may not be familiar with. Let me start by saying the prison industrial complex is a very effective system. It disenfranchises some and benefits others. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. More than two million people are incarcerated in the United States, up 700% between the period 1972 and 2014. We have 3,300 jails, 150 state prisons, and 100 federal prisons, and nearly 300 of those are private. One in 100 adults were incarcerated in 2010, the highest rate in the world. 93% of the people in U.S. prisons are male. 40% are black, although we only make up 13% of the general population. And black women are two and a half times as likely to be in prison as are white women. What does it look like in Louisiana? Louisiana has more prisoners in their prisons per capita than any state in the United States. From 1992 to 2012, a 20-year period, the Louisiana prison population doubled. One in 86 adults in Louisiana is doing time. In Louisiana, a murder conviction, by definition, dictates life without parole. And there are great rewards for those who run prisons, particularly in Louisiana. Most of the prison entrepreneurs in Louisiana are sheriffs. Let me say that again. Most of the prison entrepreneurs in Louisiana are sheriffs. They're responsible for filling the prisons and they benefit once they get filled. When we look at New Orleans specifically, one out of every 14 black men is in prison. One out of every seven black men is in prison, on parole, or on probation. In New Orleans, 5,000 black men are in jail and 400 white men are serving time. And again, my point is that there's a connection that's intentional between what we're talking about in the New Orleans schools and the Chicago schools and the prison industrial complex. It's not an accident. It's by design. And I close as I began. One cannot expect the oppressor to facilitate the liberating process of the oppressed. Thank you.